and there's a whole list of them and we're not going to be able to get through them all tonight. Um, that's not in any particular order. We're going to talk about the ones that are most important, which are veromites and the SEMA virus, except that it's not a virus. And uh, we'll cover quickly some of the others. Varroa mites have been around 30 years now. And those are what Varroa mites look like, if you've never seen one. Um, I show them on the bee there so that you can see how small they are. And they will sit there on the head of the bee and they will mostly go into the drone cone more than they will the workers cone. Thanks, Josiah. Keith Delaplane, I'm not going to read it because you can read it if you're not sitting. <laughs> um, basically said in a, in a UK magazine, I think, Bee World is that Veromites is the highest in the list of issues that are facing us. Um, so for him to say that, there has to be some truth to it. He also says, which is interesting, that the miticides we use to control them, if we do use chemicals, are doing as much harm to the bees as the mites themselves. Go. Randy Oliver, we met, or I met for the first time at the Texas Beekeepers Association convention last year. Um, he runs a website called scientificbeekeeping.com. If you haven't been there, go there. He's done a lot of sampling of bees and, and a lot of work looking at bee diseases. He said that he won't talk to anybody about diseases unless they know they might can. So that's how important grower mites are to folks in the community. Um, sorry, this isn't very readable. Um, you'll see in position one up here, and I have a pointer that works at long last. The adult bee with the varroa you can see just here. And then the mite will enter a cell with the bee larvae. In number three, the mite is actually down in the bottom of the cell in the bee food. And then it hangs on and feeds on the pupa. The female lays eggs while the bee is in its pupa and larva state. and you can see that by the time they leave the cell, the male in the immature stages stay in the cell, but the females come out with the new bee. The bees then get together, and the mites will then transfer from the bee that they grew up with onto the other bees, subsequently to get into more cells with the larva, and that's how they reproduce. Symptoms of varroa mites if you have them you'll see these brown or reddish spots on the white larvae. Now, I've got to tell you, I haven't seen them. That doesn't mean they're not in my hive. Most people will say they're in all hives, I think. I'm looking at McCartney to nod at me, but he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll see some deformed and newly emerged bees. You will see varroa mites on the adult bees behind the head on the thorax and nestled between their abdominal segments. You will also see bees discarding larvae and pupae instead of letting them come to full fruition as bees. Now, there's various ways of determining your mite count. First of all, let me talk about screen bottom boards. I think most people here in Texas, and we certainly advise you to use screen bottom boards. The whole idea being that if the mites fall off the bee, they fall through the screen at the bottom and can't climb back up. If you have a solid bottom board, they can climb back up the hive and get back onto the bees. So there are various ways of finding out a mite count within a hive. The powdered shake method. If you basically put some bees in a jar with some sugar and shake the jar, putting your hand over the lid at the time, um, getting those bees covered with sugar, the sugar will make the mites fall off the bee. At that point, you can then count the mites and return the bees to the hive. Now, they don't necessarily fly very well with all that sugar on them, but they don't die. Um, that's one way of... Now, that's not the powdered sugar method we'll talk about in a minute for getting rid of mites within the hive. This is in order to count the number of mites that you might have. Also, if you have a screen bottom board, you can put a sticky piece of plastic sheet or something underneath it 
and the mites that fall off the beast will fall onto that sheep and you can count them. That's gone. Um, mites prefer the drone brood. Now if you know that you have a lot of drone brood or if you have one of those green frames and you're raising drones, one of the ways of checking the mite count is to actually pull out some drones from their cells before they're fully developed. Um, essentially you can put one of those uncapping forks that we scrape the wax cappings off of the honey with, um, put it into five or six of the drone cells and pull them out, obviously you're going to kill them, and count the number of mites that you'll see on the drones. The book says two or more mites on a single pupa says there's a problem in the hive. Now I have to tell you I don't have enough drone comb in the same place in my hives to do that. But you can actually breed drones, especially if you're thinking about breeding queens, you're going to be breeding drones on special green frames. Please, Joseph. Oh, you did. There's an alcohol method. This is the one that Randy Oliver told us to use. Um, you essentially put a couple hundred bees in a glass jar, and you can either put ether in there, or you can put alcohol, 70% alcohol, shake the jar up and down, the bees die and the mites will separate from the bees. If you then strain the liquid to get the bees out of it, you'll be able to count the mites that you have on 200 bees. Treatments. I have to say that these aren't necessarily treatments that work. The one that everybody has been trying in recent years is powdered sugar, where you take confectioner's sugar and I think Frank told us last month how he spreads it over um, a metal framework on the top of his hive and you drop a good cupful of powdered sugar into your hive. The powdered sugar has the effect of knocking off the mites from the bees and the mites hopefully then drop through the screen bottom board that you all have. If you read the literature it tells you that this is not particularly effective at ridding your hives of mites. It will reduce the numbers, it won't get rid of the problem. If you're prepared to use chemicals, then apistan strips is the traditional method of, of dealing with mites. And I have to tell you, I don't use chemicals, I don't know how effective they are, um, but my assumption is they've been used for a long time, they are effective to some degree. But we are finding in the bee world that the more and more we use these chemicals, the less and less effective they are. Uh, Checkmite Plus, beekeeping for dummies says if you're a first year beekeeper don't use Checkmite Plus. I'm not sure why, I guess it's dangerous to humans. But if anybody wants to tell me, go ahead. Um, formic acid is a fairly new treatment for mites, but again you have to be exceptionally careful how you apply the formic acid. So buy it from a beekeeping supplier and read the instructions. And I also read that if you put some tobacco in your smoker, this also is something that the mites don't like very much. I don't know how effective that is. Sure, go ahead, Randy. Randy's telling me Apigard from Daydan, and you've had a lot of success. What is it, a strip that you put in the hive? Guard from where Dayton and it's a gel and it's a fumigant is what Randy was saying if you didn't hear and he has got rid of his mites with that now let me make the point do not take honey from your hive if you are treating your bees with chemicals because you don't want to be giving chemically stained honey to your friends and people that buy the honey from you it's okay for the bees to eat the medicated honey but it isn't really very good for you so I guess, I don't know how long, do you have to leave it a long time, Randy, after treatment before you can rub honey? Uh, no. Just a week or two? Large colonies withstand mite infestations better than small ones. So this is all standard stuff we've talked about before. The stronger the bees are, the more able they are to cope with these infestations. Um, you also should purchase your bees from reputable, 
reputable breeders, which is what we try to do. And if you do get swarms, quarantine them and look at them before you mix them in your apiary with other bees. I think I was talking to somebody tonight who said that they were recovering some bees that were really quite dodgy compared to the bees in their apiary. So varroa mites are really important. While we're on the subject of mites, we'll talk about tracheal mites, though you will probably not see them because you have to dissect the bee to be able to find them. That's um, a picture of the trachea, the breathing tube in the bee, with the tracheal mites attached to the spiracles. It's not far different from the varroa mite in its life cycle, except that instead of breeding within the comb, it's breeding within the trachea of the bees. And then, once they're bred in the spiracles or in the tracheas, they will come out, get onto the other bees, find their way into those breathing tubes. But you won't see that unless you kill a bee and dissect it and look at it under a microscope, it's gone. Symptoms, you'll see bees crawling up the sides of the hive or on blades of grass. They may appear unable to fly. Um, now the book says, if you suspect it, send it to the Texas Chief Apiary Inspector to confirm that that's what it is. And that goes for all of these diseases. As far as I know, you can quite happily send samples of bees you think are infected to the Chief Apiary Inspector and he will come back and tell you whether or not they have that disease. In some cases it's free, but I can't remember which are free and which you pay for. Do you pay for everything, Jimmy? <laughs> Jimmy's laughing at me, so you probably pay for everything. Mr. Paul actually would just love for about a hundred of us to send something to him to inspect. In various types of jar or packet or envelope. Um, but you need to slice up the thorax, stain it, and look at it under a microscope to know whether you have tracheal mites. Go ahead. The only method of treatment is menthol crystals, which act as a fumigant. I'm told if you do that, follow the instructions very carefully. No semen. No semen at the... Uh, on the tracheal mite? That, yes, sir. That used to be the, known as the Isle of Wight disease, and it wiped out most bees in the UK, which is why uh, Brother Adam decided to try to breed a better bee. Wow. I didn't know that. Does the Isle of Wight have bees now? Yes. We used to collect coloured sand from the Isle of Wight, put them in test tubes. Anyway, it's not on the subject. Um, at the Texas Beekeepers Association Convention, Randy Oliver, as I said, talked about what is your mite count. The second thing he talked about was no SEMA. As far as he was concerned at that time last year, varroa mites were the primary cause of issues and the next primary cause was the no SEMA. He called it a virus. It isn't actually a virus, it's a microsporidium. I have no idea what that means, but it's a single cell parasite. It gets into the digestive areas of the bee, and it's more prevalent in early spring. It hates, or it thrives on damp, moist hives that aren't particularly warm. It reduces the lifespan of all types of bee, reduces honey yields, and increases quite significantly the chances of a supersedure. The way you can tell, now I'm going to have to, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but I remember looking up in a book that I felt sick one day, what did I have? And it said, you know, cancer, headache, flu. And you can see when you look for bee diseases that a lot of the symptoms apply to a lot of the different diseases. So, just because you see bee feces doesn't necessarily mean you have nosema. So you're looking for a combination of these things. So bee feces on the inside and the outside of the hive, normally the bees will take it away, but if it's on the hive it's a problem. An accumulation of dead bees at the entrance, they may lose their ability to fly and you'll see them on the front of the hive with unhooked wings. And I have never seen that, so I assume that if I do I'll know it's a problem. They tremble and they quiver and they have a distended abdomen, which is not surprising if the virus is in their abdomen. You prevent it by making sure your hives don't get too damp in winter 
I suspect this is more of a problem north of here where they insulate their hives and where ventilation is not so good. Shelter from cold winds, hive entrances face south or southerly, keep the hive off the ground. Um, the next thing is counterproductive. If you put entrance reducers on, you're going to reduce the hive ventilation. So I'm not sure what the answer to that is. With screen bottom boards, it probably doesn't make any difference. But excess moisture in the winter does damage the hive and causes you problems in the spring. Again, the book says, send it to the chief inspector. And as Jimmy says, let everybody here do that. <laughs> you can actually go to that website and it tells you how to do it. Um, the treatment is with something called Fumadil B. I've no idea how effective that is or if anyone here has had to use it. It is, it works. But you have to diagnose the nosema first, which is not an easy job, I take it. Yeah, I mean, I've seen hives with like one or two inch holes drilled in the top, super, I guess, to give ventilation, or I put rocks underneath my cover to lift it slightly, though I tend to close it in the winter. But we're going to have a wet winter. Please tell me we're going to have a wet winter. <laughs> wax moths. I'm, I'm kind of getting off diseases to infestations because I think wax moth is another one that you will all see. At any rate, I saw last winter. That's an adult wax moth on the left-hand side there. The top right-hand side is the sort of mess you see on a frame when you have wax moths, either in the hive or wherever you've stored your supers for the winter. And the bottom picture is the larvae of the wax moth. And a small hive beetle. And a small hive beetle. Yeah, I know, mixed in there. When I get to the small hive beetle, I'll show the same picture. <laughs> <laughs> the grubs of small hive beetle and wax moth, one will burst when you squeeze it and one won't. Do you know which I'm one? I'm not trying to squeeze it. I, I think the small hive beetle would burst. No, the, the, the grub of the small hive beetle, the, the larvae, versus the larvae of the wax moth, they both oh. look the same, but one will burst when you squeeze it and one won't, and I forgot which Does one. Does everybody hear that? Try squeezing. What, the research project for this month is to squeeze the larvae of the wax moth <laughs> and the small hive beetle and tell McCartney which one which one makes a mess and which one doesn't. <laughs> Alright, comb will be destroyed because the wax moths or the larvae from the wax moth or the wax moths themselves will tunnel through leaving a lot of those silk strands that you saw in the picture. Um, you'll see cocoons maybe on the wooden parts of the frames. You'll see moth droppings throughout the hive and you'll probably see the bottom board with pieces of comb the screen bottom board, I hasten to say. If you, well you have to do a number of things. First of all, make sure you keep clearing your bottom board or your screen bottom board of any loose materials. Now, I don't think you're gonna do that every two weeks when you open the hive, but certainly before you close up the hive for the winter, I would clean off the bottom board, and it's the first thing I do after I've looked at the bees in the spring. Examine the colonies you're looking for, it, and don't do what I did. So, one, the one little funny. I took all my supers last year and I put them in plastic bags in the barn. I thought, if I put them in plastic bags, this is wonderful. Nothing will get through that plastic, will it? And when I took them out in the spring, they were absolutely covered in wax moths and wax moth larvae because they love the dark. So, essentially, when you store your supers in the winter, store them a little caddy corner so that there's an airflow through them and store them in the light during the day. Wax moths hate the light. One, thing, one other thing that you can do is what we do is sometimes when we have a storm, we freeze them beforehand because yeah. there's always wax moth larva, or not larva, the eggs laid in the wax, and freezing them just kills it all, and you can seal it up in a plastic bag and nothing's going to get in because everything yeah. inside is dead. And, and I learned that one. In fact, what I did with the frames was once I found I'd got this infestation, yeah, they all went in the freezer for 24 hours. That kills off anything wax moth that's in there. 
and then you can just put them in the hives and the bees will clean them up faster than you can. Does Fraser now make the wax real upper? Um, yes. I don't know. Yes, it does. Wax does get brittle the colder you put it. But you're only going to freeze them for 24 hours, right. and you're going to be careful. Take it out when you apply it yes. Oh, okay. See, my feeling about wax being brittle or whatever is you're going to be careful with your frames anyway once they've got drawn out combs on them. I mean, you're not going to knock them against corners and knock off the comb because your poor bees have to rebuild it, even if McCartney knocks his about. <laughs> so, um, yeah, freeze them overnight and keep your supers at least in the light as much as you can through the winter. Go. The small hive beetle. I put up that picture, it makes it look huge, doesn't it? That's a, that's a foot across, right? That's what they look like. Go ahead, Josiah. But they're really only that small. So when you see a small hive beetle, he will, mostly when you see a small hive beetle, it will be scuttling across a frame or scuttling across the bottom of your hive, and they look just like that. They love little dark corners. Anywhere they can find dark corners, they'll huddle like that. And the larvae of the small hive beetle, which may or may not squish when you squish it, <laughs> is in the bottom there. Now, also in the bottom there, I think that's the effect of a lot of small hive beetles in amongst the honey, because it trashes the honey, essentially. You really have, if it gets to as bad as that bottom picture, I'd throw the frame away or burn it. I don't think freezing it would clean up that frame. Okay, what I said, they scuttle across the combs. You often find them in the bottom board in dark corners. Now, if you've got a screen bottom board, that's less likely, but they'll be in the dark corners. I'm told if you have an amber light at night, you can find them. I don't tend to open my hives at night because they're full of bees then. But if you want to and you have an amber light, you might be able to see small hive beetles. I personally think if you have to go to that extent to find them, the bees will control them anyway. Um, you'll see damaged combs, you'll see discoloured honey, and apparently if you have a big infestation, the honey will smell of decaying oranges. And again, I say to some people, I don't know what I'm talking about tonight, I have never smelt decaying oranges, I don't know if it's true. It's, as with all these diseases, if you have strong colonies, they'll handle the small hive beetles. I have seen them in my hives, I'm probably fairly certain they're in every hive that exists to some degree or another, um, a strong colony will handle them. Uh, you can freeze the frames to get rid of them. Don't leave frames with honey lying around for any length of time. Now, the book was talking about this in relation to small hive beetles, but I'm going to tell you that if you leave, if you rob a hive of honey and leave it in an open box, something will be at it. So the rule is, if you're going to rob the honey, then extract it within a few days, preferably a day, and then put them back on the hives for the bees to clean up. And again, if you do that quickly, the bees will clean up those frames much quicker and much more effectively than you can. There are chemicals that will control small hive beetles. The book says beginners shouldn't use those two chemicals, and again, I don't know why. I suspect they're dangerous. I suspect you have to be very careful how you use them. And I think I read that with something like Checkmite Plus, you can do as much damage to the bees as you can to the enemies of the bees. How am I doing, Jimmy? All right? These days, or whether it's mostly, I mean, do we see it, the commercial folks amongst us? Randy, wherever you are. That's what it looks like, but let's move on. You will know foul brood by the fact that the larvae will change colour. The larvae that are normally a nice bright white colour in the bottom of all the cells will change colours to brown and then turn into a black scale, which will lie lengthways on the bottom of the cells. It has a sunky, greasy appearance. And so the way you test for American foul brood, or the simple way of testing, is called the ropiness test. If you take a toothpick and put it into the cell of a frame that is infected with American foul brood, then as you pull the toothpick slowly out, a rope of 
uh, gun <laughs> of nastiness will come out with it. And that's the test for American, that's the easy test for American foul brood. There's also a putrid odor, which I guess why it got its name of foul brood. Teramycin or Thailan are the two chemical treatments for American foul brood. If you don't treat the hives, I understand you burn the frames for this disease. You burn the whole thing down. You burn the hive the lot. You burn the whole hive. And you wait until it's night and all the bees are in it, and you close it up and you, you suffocate them and kill them. <laughs> What's a better way to do that? Did, do you agree with that, Jimmy? Teramycin, that's the best way. <laughs> when, I, when I was talking with Dr. Uh, uh, Jackson, uh, he was saying that, that if, it's more, if it's gone more than one or two frames, the whole hive now has it, and you've got to kill that hive before it dies and it's robbed out by the other hives and it spreads. So you've got to treat it or kill it. Okay, we're in the realm that I've always said since I started these lectures of 10 beekeepers will have 10 opinions and I'm not saying any of them is right or wrong. If you have American foul brood, you can try teramycin, it may or may not work. I will tell you that I agree with Carl McCartney. If you've got a hive that's really infested with it, yeah, you're better off to just burn it. It depends how you feel whether you can save them. Try the teramycin first. If it doesn't save the bees, what we're saying is don't mix bees frames from a foul brood hive with anything else in your apiary. It's a very dangerous disease, but it's not prevalent enough now. It's not epidemic. When they were burning hives, it was because foul brood was epidemic. It's just like cook and mouth disease. You shot all the cows and buried them, you burned all the hives. And so it, it, because it's not epidemic anymore, I don't think you need to be as, as ruthless in your treatment of it, but I would certainly take the right steps you need to get rid of it. Just keep it away from the rest of your bees. Elizabeth. We had um, probably something we weren't sure if it was bad or not, but because they were weakened by that, um, they got beetles, and the beetles took over the rest of what was in there, and so we did just go ahead and burn that. I will tell you burning is a last resort. After you've burnt it, you have no other place to go. Oh, I got a small laugh, I guess. There's a... There's a similar but different disease called European foul brood. I guess it's European, so it doesn't smell as much as American foul brood. <laughs> you gotta laugh out of that one. <laughs> yeah, but you know, they're laughing at me on that one. Go. Again, you'll see the larvae will change color. I'm told the tracheal system will become visible and you'll see silver lines through the body of the larvae. They'll be contorted. You will know if you see infected larvae, they will look bad and they will be brown, not white. Now, if you try the ropiness test on European frau bird, you do not get the string of gunge as you take the stick out. It's a lot drier, a gunge, if you can have dry gunge. And again, teramycin's the treatment, and I'm not getting into whether you burn the hive or not. You try teramycin, but don't put the frames anywhere near any more of your bees. There's something called chalk brood. Chalk brood's interesting because I don't think it damages any more than the cells that it's in. Go. You'll see holes in the cappings in your brood. The bees will take out the dead larva and throw them on the bottom board. Um, you'll see the chalky spots spotted across the brood. Actually, the comb is supposed to rattle when you shake it if you have chalk brood. And that's only because the chalk brood is like chalk. It's a solid thing, and it will rattle, I guess, in the frames. There is no chemical treatment for chalk brood. Either the bees are strong enough to overcome it, or they're not. Unless there's something more recent that I don't know about. Oh, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> I figured if I got here, I was finished.